colleagues in the House and Senate, the governor, to all mayors here, to our two senators, and to Senator Brown, who I traveled with here, the two most powerful words I can say, thank you. But before I walk off, Timing is everything. Please look to the aisle and you will see Congresswoman Eddie Bernice Johnson, who is the chairwoman of science and technology and led this. Welcome my friend all the way from Texas to be here today. Thank you, God bless you. And just in case you didn't remember, yes, I'm Congresswoman Joyce Beatty and I approve this message. Thank you, Congresswoman Beatty. Please welcome to the stage the Chief Global Operations Officer, Intel, Kayvon S. Jarfani. <laughs> All right, folks, first of all, I'm going to keep this very brief. Most of you heard from me earlier today. Uh, there's no place better for me to be than here in Ohio today. We have an amazing project that's going to be going for us. We're going to build, you know, the, the advanced semiconductor manufacturing, state-of-the-art manufacturing right here behind us. You know, the tractors, as you see, are happening. We're going to make this so, so amazingly successful. But with that, it's not just building the factory. It's going to require us to make sure that the pipeline of talent, collaboration with our universities, and of course, no better person here than, of course, the biggest advocate for this project since day one, our uh, good friend, the president of Ohio State University, Dr. Christina Johnson. I want to welcome her to the, to the stage here for her to change some with words with you. Thank you. Wow, what a day. Mr. President, CEO Gelsinger, elected officials and special guests, I am so proud to be here today sharing this platform with not only you, but the Fort Hayes Milton Ruffin Gospel Choral and the best damn band in the land. And I'm also so proud of the role that The Ohio State University and all the colleges and universities played in making this groundbreaking a reality. Most of you are probably familiar with Moore's first law, Intel's co-founder Gordon Moore's accurate prognostication that the number of transistors on an integrated circuit will double every two years. And thanks to companies like Intel, since I was a chip designer in college, we've watched those transistor line widths shrink from microns to nanometers and soon to angstroms and the power of our devices increase exponentially. If you want to calculate my age, I just gave you all the facts. You may not be able to, however, or may be aware of Moore's second law, which predicted a harsher reality, that the cost of semiconductor processing facilities would also grow exponentially. So getting the United States back in the business of manufacturing state-of-the-art computer chips domestically is a breathtakingly capital-intensive and ambitious proposition. It requires a revival of that powerful private-public partnership of industry, government, and academia that has defined this country's best efforts in science and engineering since World War II. Today, we're celebrating Intel for, making, for having the vision to make this historical capital investment in Licking County. But we also thank President Biden, Commerce Secretary Raimondo, and the United States Congress for, for supporting American semiconductor manufacturing, design, and research, and for helping to even the playing field with the Chips and Science Act of 2022. I have the privilege today of representing the region's higher education sector, which stands ready to educate the workforce that Intel and its suppliers and customers will need. At the same time, we support new advances in semiconductor technology through our research. Providing intellectual capital and groundbreaking research for this effort is bigger than any one university alone, and I welcome all the presidents of the Ohio universities that are here today in force. We've come together to create a network 
of colleges and universities and community colleges into a 12 university and college Midwest regional network focused on doing our part to foster a semiconductor ecosystem here. I want to thank Intel for its contributions to that workforce, education, and research, including pledging $50 million in direct support for Ohio colleges and universities, as well as another $50 million that will be matched by the Science Foundation for grants nationwide. And thank you, NSF Director Seth Panchanathan, who is here. Just today, Intel announced a $17.7 million investment in eight projects in Ohio. And in addition, $4.8 million of that $17.7 is for the Advanced Semiconductor Fabrication Research and Education, or CAFE, that Ohio State will lead. We are so fortunate in Ohio to have political leadership that understands the importance of knowledge and in technology-intensive industries to our state's future, as well as the role higher education plays in developing the ideas and the people for those industries. I'd like to thank Governor DeWine, Lieutenant Governor Husted, Senators Portman and Brown, our congressional representatives, our Ohio Senate, our Ohio House, and all our elected officials. We couldn't do this without you. And of course, I'd also like to thank our amazing economic development partners, Jobs Ohio and One Columbus. As Intel breaks ground today, we're here to strengthen the Silicon Heartland. And that's what today is all about. But you should know that 12% of the nation's engineers, bachelor's degrees, 18% of the country's doctorates in engineering, and 22% of the doctors, doctorates in engineering technology are earned at Big Ten schools. Those engineers will no longer need to head to the coast for cutting edge jobs. They will be able to find them right here. The Ohio State University cheers the geographic expansion of intellectual and financial opportunity. This is a great moment for all of us. Mr. Gelsinger, President Biden, thank you for making this happen. Tina Johnson, please welcome to the stage Effion Hawkins. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Affion Ibakate Hawkins, and I am a student at Central Ohio Technical College, working towards my associate degree. Intel CEO, Pat Gensler, grew up next door, right in Pennsylvania, and started his career as an with an associate degree from a community college. That's why I'm personally excited to be here celebrating with you all, because students like me, we have an incredible opportunity Thanks to Intel. Please join me in welcoming Intel CEO, Pat Gensler, to the stage. Thank you so much. We made it. You know, and as you think about this moment, you know, I just ask you, what aspect of your life is not becoming more digital? You know, every aspect of health, every aspect of social, every aspect of transportation is becoming more digital. And everything digital runs on semiconductors. And our ability to work remotely through the pandemic was because of semiconductors, to stay connected with our families and friends, to have virtual schooling and healthcare through this period of time. Everything, semiconductors, and our national defense is becoming more acutely dependent on semiconductors. And do we want our national defense to have the most advanced semiconductors in the world? You bet we do. 
And do we want to be dependent on foreign sources for those? You bet we don't. And for our entire history, we at Intel have performed the majority of our R&D and manufacturing right here in the US. We are the only US chip maker that put, you know, does all the R&D, manufacturing leadership, technology development in the United States. And as we came to this period in our strategy, we put our chips on the table. Yeah, I like that joke too. And we did it. We put our chips on the table to help the U.S. regain its manufacturing heart as well as unquestioned technology leadership. And our partnership in Ohio is off to a great start. And under Governor DeWine, Lieutenant Governor, you know, this, you know, we just feel, come on down, Ohio wants us. And it's just been an incredible relationship. And the great support we've seen from the Ohio delegation of political leaders. And, you know, Senator Portman and uh, Brown, uh, you, know, you know, these have just been extraordinary partners uh, for us. And I show up in D.C. and boy, you know, we just go to work, you know, together. And of course, Representatives Balderson and Beatty, you know, just thank you. Thank you so much for the partnership. You know, and this great state of Ohio has this tradition of manufacturing. You all like to build stuff. And that's exactly what we're going to do together. We are going to build the most advanced stuff in the world right here in Ohio. And we benefit from this long tradition. You know, essential industries, steel, engines, automobiles, chemicals, and more. You know, and because of that manufacturing tradition and the strong technology capabilities of the local universities, this became an obvious choice. And back in January, Ohio Senator Brown, you know, made that statement, you know, the Rust Belt is dead and the Silicon Heartland begins. And I'll say, he was the one to kill the Rust Belt, but Silicon Heartland, that was my phrase. <laughs> but this idea of the Silicon Heartland, right, you know, an epicenter of leading edge technology, and Intel's factory right here will produce the most advanced process technologies in the world. And our customers, our foundry customers, some of them being here today, they need the best stuff for their products. Everything from high performance mobile, artificial intelligence, advanced computing, cloud, all of that will be a result of these factories behind us. Advanced packaging, you know, reliable workforce, including as you've seen today, the most advanced trades on the planet are required to build this facility. And I'll just say, we are thrilled for the response that we have seen across that spectrum. And I say, every aspect of highly trained technical workers, workers, construction, we're gonna get to work. And I, you know, we only gave you half a day off of the groundbreaking, so don't screw around, get back to work. But it also is that pipeline of talent in science, engineering, mathematics, innovation, you know, the imaginative, creative skills. And I like to say it's not just STEAM, STEM, it's STEAM, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. And the need for these skills in America is growing, and we're not keeping pace with that pipeline. And fewer U.S. students are choosing the sector of semiconductors and manufacturing engineering as a career choice. We need to change that. And we need to bring this workforce forward. And that's why you heard this morning from Christy Pambianchi where you know, we are committing our 50 million, the first 17.7 .7 million committed in these first eight partnerships with 80 participants. You know, this is the first step, but it's just the first step because you know, we are moving forward to build the next generation workforce and to harvest. And I want, you know, as I, I, I say, I want every mother and grandmother in the state of Ohio to say, you don't need to go to the coast, come home and work right here. And, you know, it's not, you know, and it's not low-end workers, it's not medium, it's not the highest PhD, it's not construction workers, you know, it's not the next generation, you know, of math, and uh, we had, you know, Finn up here, the next CEO of Intel, it is all of them across the entire spectrum is what we need. And as someone who began my career, you know, my uh, family uh, is here, you know, my mom and dad went to school in a one-room, first through eighth grade schoolhouse where my mom still lives 
today. She said, go to school. So I began in, uh, as a, I skipped my senior year of high school, got my associate's degree, and was hired as a young technician at Intel. I know what it feels like to go from the bottom upward. And that's the heart of Ohio. This idea of the community colleges, the most advanced universities, giving opportunity across that spectrum. And that's part of why I am so excited. And I was one state off, you know, I was in Pennsylvania, sorry. You know, right? And I always like to say that when, when you get to nowhere in Pennsylvania, we were just five more miles. Technology plays a critical role in building a digital future, a future that is equitable, prosperous, accessible, and inclusive for all. You know, and this is why we are so excited about the things that we are going to do together here in Ohio. You know, and when I first walked through the doors of the company, you know, the company that puts silicon into Silicon Valley, you know, why has so much innovation happened in Silicon Valley? Right, you know, it's Silicon Valley. And this is the company, Gordon Moore, Andy Grove, you know, Bob Noyce, the companies, the trinity that started Silicon Valley. And today, we're the company that's gonna put the silicon into the heartland, the Silicon Heartland. But today, this is also a testament to the power of public and private coming together. And we have been aggressive in lobbying, working with, the administration, working with the congressional leaders in the House and in the Senate at the state level as well. Why? Because it is that important for the nation. And I'll tell you, the passage of the CHIPS Act, the most seminal piece of industrial policy legislation from World War II, we all together deserve to celebrate this moment. And I just say thank you all for all who helped make this most critical legislation happen. And I just say, you know, regardless of political affiliation, you know, this is a proud moment where we reached across the aisle and we got something really important done. But I'll just say, we would not be here, right, without our political leaders. We would not be here without the president and his leadership, Secretary Raimondo, Secretary of Commerce, all of these working to bring this across the finish line. And of course, it was a bipartisan bill. How often do you hear that today? Senators Schumer, and Cornyn, Senator uh, Representatives Matsui and McCall as the sponsors for the act. And we were thrilled that we, Intel, had a part to play in making that legislation happen. We are honored to be part of that role. In addition to the Ohio delegation, you know, Eddie Bernice Johnson of Texas, Senator Maria Cantwell, others were just crucial in coming by you know, to make this legislation, you know, happen. And, you know, we have Representative Ro Khanna. You know, Silicon Valley, that's Ro. He's Intel's congressman who's here today as well. And Ro, you know, thank you for joining us. And it isn't just that Ro decided to come and join your party. He deeply believes that the power of technology needs to be across the nation and not just in Silicon Valley. And I thank you for that, Ro. And with that, it is my honor, an honor that a farm kid from Pennsylvania should never even dream of, the honor to say the following words. It is my pleasure to introduce the President of the United States. Please join me in welcoming President Biden. Thank you, Pat, for that introduction. And uh, pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. It was just back in January when we were together at the White House with Senator Brown and Senator Portman announcing this historic investment. 
In March, I shared the story in my State of the Union address, the story of the field of dreams in the middle of Ohio, where America's future will be built. In August, we were back at the White House as I signed the Chips and Science Act, one of the most significant science and technology investments in our history. And now, in September, Gov, we're here breaking ground. And thanks for the passport to get to the state, Gov. Appreciate it. All in nine months in America, I want to thank Sherrod Brown for his relentless work, especially making sure that labor is in on this deal. And Pat just mentioned what Sherrod makes clear. It's time to bury the label Rust Belt and call it, as Pat said, the Silicon Heartland. That's what's happening in these 1,000 acres. I want to thank Rob Portman for being the gentleman and decent man that he is and for showing that Democrats and Republicans can work together to get big things done for our country. I really mean it. I'm trying to find where he's sitting, but he's a good man. Thank you. You're leaving a hell of a legacy as you leave what you're doing as a consequence of you, in large part. And thanks to the bipartisan group of Ohio congressional delegation here today. Tim Ryan, thank you for your leadership, always representing this to the working people. Thank you, Congressman Joyce Beatty. And, uh, you know, uh, I don't think we could have gotten the infrastructure bill done without Joyce. She was the final capstone. I thought we all thought it was hanging in the balance there. But I don't know what you did that last four hours, but whatever you did, you got it done. <laughs> and Dave Joyce, Anthony Gonzalez, Mike Carey, Tony Balderson for the work in the House. We're also joined by congressional leaders from around the country who fought so hard for this, this bill. Eddie Bernice Johnson, chair of the House Science Committee. Eddie, this whole bill would have gotten, wouldn't have gotten done without you. It really wouldn't have. We're also joined by Congressman Ro Kahana. Ro uh, is a tireless champion for American innovation and seeing that workers, workers are part of the deal. While she couldn't be here, Maria Cantwell also deserves a lot of credit. She's chair of the Senate Commerce Committee from the state of Washington. Maria was tireless in getting this bill through the Senate. And again, Mike, want to thank you for your work on this project as well. And I especially want to thank the labor leaders here. My dear friend, dear friend Lonnie Stevenson, the IBW, Tim Berger, the president of AFL-CIO, Brent Booker, treasurer of the National Building Trades, Mike Kinsley, president of Ohio Building Trades, you know, it's fitting to break ground for America's future here in Ohio. Think about it. There's kind of a tradition here. The Wright brothers, Neil Armstrong, John Glenn, they defined America's spirit, a spirit of daring and innovation. Pat Chase laid out Intel's vision that builds on that legacy. A brand new $20 billion campus, 7,000 construction jobs, union construction jobs, 3,000 full-time jobs that will pay an average of 135000 a year, and not all of them will require a college degree once these facilities are built. And here's a critical piece. Intel is using a project labor agreement for this investment. For the folks at home, these are agreements the contractors, subcontractors, and union put in place before construction begins. They ensure Major projects are handled by well-trained, well-prepared, highly skilled workers. They resolve disputes ahead of time, ensuring the safer work sites, avoiding disruptions and work stoppages that can cause extensive delays and down the line. These agreements make sure construction is top-notch and projects are on time, on task, and on budget. Back in February, I signed an executive order to make sure federal construction projects use these project labor agreements. It's a big deal that Intel is using one here, and I thank them for that. And Intel is going to build a workforce of the future right here in Ohio. As you already heard, Intel committed $50 million to partner with community colleges and universities like Ohio State University, including Central State University, the only historically black university in Ohio, to build a pipeline for students in the semiconductor industry. The director of National Science Foundation is here, Dr. Ponch. He's here, and IF and Intel are going to invest $50 million each to support these kinds of partnerships. Folks, at home, at home, 
But you may be wondering, why is this such a big deal for manufacturing? Something so small in size as a fingerprint, as a, you know, an in, a, a semiconductor. Well, semiconductors are small computers that power everyday lives, smartphones, cars, washing machines, hospital equipment, internet, electric grid, and so much more, including our national security. And here's the deal. America invented this chip. America invented it. It powered NASA's moon mission. Federal investment helped bring down the cost of making these chips, creating a market and an entire industry. As a result, over 30 years ago, America had more than 30 percent of the global chip production. Then something happened. America back, American manufacturing, the backbone, the backbone of our economy got hollowed out. Companies moved jobs overseas, especially from the industrial Midwest. And as a result, Today, we're down to producing barely 10 percent of the world's chips, despite leading in chip research and design. And as we saw during the pandemic, when factories that make these ships shut down, chips shut down, the global economy comes to a halt, driving up costs for families and everyone, not just here, but around the world. In fact, one-third of the core inflation last year was due to higher prices of automobiles because of the shortage of the semiconductors needed to build those automobiles. Folks, we need to make these chips right here in America to bring down everyday costs and create good jobs. Don't take my word for it. You heard Pat. Listen to the business leaders across this country. They're making decisions right now about where to invest and produce these chips. China, Japan, South Korea, European Union, all these places are investing tens of billions of dollars to attract chip manufacturers to their countries. But industry leaders are choosing us, the United States, because they see America's back and America's leading the way. <laughs> Folks, since I took office, our economy has created nearly 10 million new jobs more than 668,000 manufacturing jobs. Proof, a point that made in Ohio and made in America is no longer just a slogan. It's happening. It's a reality today, and it's just beginning. Because I signed in the law the Chips and Science Act, we're accelerating the progress. This new law makes historic investments for companies to build advanced manufacturing facilities here in America. Since I signed the Chips and Science Act, it's already started happening. The American company Micron announced it's going to invest $40 billion in the next 10 years to build factories, special chips called memory chips that store information on your smartphones. That's going to create 40,000 good-paying jobs and increase the share, America's share of the memory chip market five. 100 percent. Two other companies, Global Foundries and Qualcomm, announced a $4 billion partnership to produce chips in America that would otherwise have been made overseas. Qualcomm is one of the world's largest designers of chips and planning to boost production by up to 50 percent over the next five years. Today, in North Carolina, Wolfspeed is investing $5 billion to make chip devices for electric vehicles that are going to create 1,800 good-paying jobs over five years. Folks, the future of the chip industry is going to be made in America. Made in America. <laughs> Folks at home should know the manufacturer of these semiconductors connects countless small businesses and manufacturers into a supply chain that's going to thrive all because of this law. Imagine if we had more of these kinds of factories across the country. This law makes that a reality. It matters. All of this is in our economic interest, and it's in our national security interest as well. Earlier this year, I went to Lockheed's factory in Alabama. They're making the Javelin missile that we're supplying to Ukraine to defend itself against Putin's unprovoked war. We need semiconductors not only for those Javelin missiles, 
but also for the weapon systems of the future that are only going to be more reliant on computer chips. This goes well beyond commercial need. Unfortunately, we produce zero, zero of these advanced chips in America. Zero. And China's trying to move way ahead of us in manufacturing now. It's no wonder, which is highly somewhat unusual, that the Chinese Communist Party actively lobbied U.S. business against this law. Basically, you want to do business in our country, don't do it there. The United States has to lead the world in producing these advanced chips. And this law makes sure that we will. And to be clear, the Chips and Science Act is not handing out blank checks to companies. I've directed my administration to be laser-focused on the guardrails that will protect taxpayers' dollars. We'll make sure the companies partner with unions, community colleges, technical schools to offer training and apprenticeships and to work with small and minority-owned businesses as well. We're going to make sure that companies that take taxpayers' dollars don't turn around and make investments in China to undermine our supply chain and national security. You know, we have the power. We have the power to take back any federal funding if companies don't meet these requirements. The law also requires that companies build these semiconductor facilities by Davis-Bacon prevailing wage so people can live with a little bit of breathing room. And this will ensure tens of thousands of new construction jobs and high-paying jobs, and more often, high-paying union jobs. And well, not only will companies use these funds to buy, but they cannot use these funds for stock buybacks and issue dividends. They have to manufacture. And finally, the law is about more than chips. It's about science as well. You know, decades ago, the United States of America invested 2 percent of its gross domestic product, 2 percent, in research and development. We led in everything. We created everything from internet to the GP to GPS. Today, we invest somewhere between seven tenths, but less than one percent in research and development. The United States of America. We used to rank number one in the world in research and development. Now we rank number nine. China was number eight a decade ago. Now China is number two. And other countries are closing in fast. The Chips and Science Act moves us up once again. It authorizes funding to boost our research and development investment back closer to 1 percent of our GDP. That's the fastest single year of growth in 70 years, but it's still not enough. We're going to make sure we lead the world in industries of the future, from quantum computing to artificial intelligence to advanced biotechnology. Think of the things and the kinds of investment we deliver vaccines for cancer, cures for HIV, inventing the next be best thing that hasn't even been imagined yet. That's who America's always been. It's something that's really important. We're going to make sure that any company that uses federal funding for research and development to invent new technologies will have to make that technology here in America. That means we will invent it in America and make it in America. And we're going to make sure we include all of America. We're going to support entrepreneurs and technology hubs all across the country, including historically black colleges and universities, minority serving institutions, tribal colleges. We're going to go into tap into the greatest competitive advantage we have, our diverse and talented workforce that's urban, rural, and suburban. Folks, I've asked Pat and many other leading businessmen leaders this question. When the United States decides to invest in considerable resources in a new industry that we need to build, does that encourage business to invest as well? And the answer is yes. Overwhelmingly, ask any major business person, because they say, if we think it's worth investing in, and we're putting tax dollars into it, it has an increased possibility of being usable and workable. Federal investments attracts private investment. It creates jobs. It creates industries. It demonstrates we're all in this together. And I believe there's another reason why companies are choosing the United States. It's because we're better positioned globally than we have ever been in a long, long time. 
we've seen a faster, stronger economic recovery than any other advanced nation on Earth. I met with one of the leading companies, research companies in South Korea. I asked why they're going to invest billions of dollars in the United States. He said, because you're the most secure nation in the world. We know if we invest, it will be secure. And secondly, this surprised me. You have the best workforce in the world. Folks, and we have the best universities in the world. Dynamic venture capital system, a rule of law that protects international property. And thanks to the infrastructure law that I signed with the help of many of the members who are here today, that means better roads, bridges, ports, airports, clean water, high-speed internet for every American. That's going to create millions of jobs all by itself. This is a game changer. Let me close with this. This is about our economic security. It's about our national security. It's about good paying union jobs you can raise a family on, as my dad was saying, have a little bit of breathing room. Jobs now, jobs for the future, jobs in every part of the country. We're not going to leave a part behind. There's no need to not develop the whole country. Jobs that show. The industrial Midwest is back. The industrial Midwest is back. And that's what you'll see in this field of dreams. PhD engineers and scientists alongside community college graduates, skilled craftsmen, men and women, people of all ages, races, and backgrounds with advanced degrees or no degrees, working side by side doing the most sophisticated manufacturing that's ever been done. Pat was explaining to me what these are going to look like. Correct me if I'm wrong, Pat. But I was, I was impressed. You're going to dig down 60 feet, 10 football fields long. You're going to have make that all cement. You're going to use that as basis to build on because you need security. You need stability for what you have on top. And you're going to build up stories beyond. I mean, this is incredible. Making a tiny computer chip the size of a fingertip. They're showing what we've always believed. And I want to emphasize this, and I'll get out of your hair. And I mean this. You've heard me say this for a long time. There is nothing. I mean this from the bottom of There is nothing, not a single thing beyond our capacity as a nation if we do it together as the United States of America. And that's what we're going to do. This is an inflection point. Everything. We're going to look back on this period 20 years from now and say that's when it began to change. God bless you all, and may God protect our troops. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Pat, thank you.